Welcome, everyone. I'm so happy to have Eleanor Koenig today as our guest. Eleanor is our latest forum moderator inside of Obsidian, and uh, she's just a, a, what I'd call a power user of Obsidian in the sense that she really uses it for her daily life. Uh, she uses it for her fiction writing, which I can't wait to get into. She uses it for the notes. She's a middle school teacher, and she uses it for organizing her notes for, for school and classes. And she contributes so much to many of the comments and questions that people have inside of Obsidian. And I can't wait to dig in and see how she uses Obsidian for fiction writing in particular, and um, as well as organizing her notes. And if I'm not mistaken, Eleanor, I think one of the things that you do or have done with your middle school class is you actually help them organize their notes. And so that's a really, really cool skill that um, I wish more kids um, and I wish I learned when I was a kid how to better organize my notes at that age. So I can't wait to dig into that. So with all that, Eleanor, thank you for joining us and being with us today. Yeah, I'm really happy to be able to help people. I get a ton of questions about, you know, hey, how do you do this and how do you do that? What does that look like for you? So I'm eager to have the opportunity to share with people in a video forum so that you can actually see how I do it and what it looks like. Can't, can't wait to jump in and we'll look at your plugins. We'll see how you, how you do everything and all that. But before we get into screen sharing, um, tell us just a little bit about your background because interesting. So you're a fiction writer, um, you're, you're a middle school teacher. How did you, well, let's, and, and I want to really build up to, how did you come to Obsidian? But first, start with the fiction writing. Where did that, is that uh, something you've always um, been interested in? Where did it come from? And uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about that. So it actually comes from my grandmother. When I was in second grade back in the early 90s, um, she bought me a typewriter because my grandmother was very much of the opinion that every woman needs to be able to support herself and the jobs that a woman can support herself with are things like teaching and being a secretary and all of those jobs needed typing skills. So she sat me down and I had to do ASDFJK. So this is a real typewriter you're talking Partly about. Like, here, yeah, right? this was before computers. Uh, I'm in my 30s. So the computers were like a thing. My husband had one, but I didn't, my family didn't have a computer, but I had a typewriter and um, I learned, like I wasn't allowed to touch the G or the H key for months. Like, <laughs> I had to learn the correct yep. way to type. And what that meant was when I went to school, I talked about typing a lot. And there was a girl in my third grade class who wrote fiction and she wanted me to type it up for her. In third so, grade. In third grade. So in third grade, I learned about fiction writing and how that was a thing you can do. And I wrote my very first Wizard of Oz fan fiction on my typewriter in like 93, maybe 97. That, I don't remember, that's cool. A long time ago. <laughs> so, so you remember then the days of like error correcting tape to like put little stuff in there to like white out, you know, yeah, mistakes and those kinds awful. of things. <laughs> I, I too also learned on a typewriter in my case, the keys were I actually had a typing class. It was mandatory in my school and it was the typewriters had tape over the the letters. So you, you couldn't see um, what letters were. So it, it took you away from looking down because looking down, you wouldn't see anything anyway to kind of learn, learn that way. And interestingly, I think that was really helpful learning on a manual typewriter because my, my typing speed is compared to others is very, very fast, not through any exceptional skill of mine, but I think because I learned on a manual typewriter, I can type very, very quickly. Yeah, I'm the same. I type like 120 words a minute, which yeah. compared to some of my programmer friends isn't particularly impressive, but my students are always like, how do you do that? Yeah. Like, well, I don't look at my keyboard and I use all my yeah. fingers. Now I can, I can probably type a little bit fast. I'm probably closer to 150, but my thumb typing, like texting and that, forget it. I'm like, <laughs> you know, one word a minute when it comes to uh, texting. So yeah, it's a, a generational thing, but that's cool. Okay. So you started, you had the interest in third grade. And did you keep up with it? Were you writing fiction from third grade on? Yeah, I just I've I've been writing fiction my whole life. I really enjoy it. I've learned a lot from it. It's um it's it's how I process information actually. I don't imagine most people are up on the latest research on education and how we learn, but um we learn better through narrative for most things. And I find that if I take a piece of information about, I don't know, ancient Mesopotamia was I think 
uh, the previous interviewee's dissertation. And I've, I'm a big fan of Mesopotamia and Phoenicia and all of those places. But if you take a piece of information from that, you put it into the context of a story, you remember it better. You can interact with it more. You can relate to it more. So I've really always sort of written stories about interesting things I learned in school and things I came across on the news. That's how That's I process really information. You know, and that's a really important point that you make. And I think one that maybe a lot of people don't appreciate is the power of story, the power of narrative. And I see in, in my past life, I used to sit through so many corporate presentations that people would give or pitch decks when people would pitch to me as a, um, as a startup uh, investor. And, and so many times the, the pitches were just so dry and so unengaging. And it's so simple that stories, we relate to stories, we connect with stories, we're wired to relate to stories. And the best way to, to connect with somebody is, is to hook them into a story. And, and I think it's, a, it's an art and a skill that many people could benefit from really learning how to communicate um, in stories or using, or I should say, the use of stories and the use of narrative to help with enhanced communication. Absolutely. I mean, so I was a lawyer in my former life and the differences in how successful I was in classes that were based in case law and the story of why this rule came to be versus the classes that were about memorizing particular, you know, 1246B or whatever thing we had to memorize how many days until civil procedure things happened. I was, I was like the worst class I ever took in my life, but I did well in everything else. And it's because I learned through stories. Yeah. You know, it's interesting too. It's that that whole topic of memorization, you know, and, and you as a teacher, you know, I'm sure you can appreciate that, you know, teaching kids how to memorize things. Are we really teaching them how to learn? Are we really teaching them how to process information? Are we really teaching them how to think? I haven't taught a child to memorize anything in my entire yeah. career, so I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good for it's you. Not a thing we do anymore. Yep. Yeah. All right, cool. So how did you... Um, so you've been fiction writing all this time. How did you come to Obsidian? Like, was your search for Obsidian through your fiction writing or what, what led you to Obsidian? A friend recommended it, actually. So I have been I've been running the gamut of every kind of wiki and note taking and world building software that exists. I've used probably the vast majority of the software out there for keeping track of a complex world. I'm a, I'm, I really enjoy writing complex world, world buildings. I write for World Building Magazine. I, I just, I like learning in that way. That's in, cool. in, in some cool. ways, I write as much to have a focus for my research as I do like to have a finished product. I yeah. will admit that in public. Um, and so I've, I've tried out uh, World Anvil, I've tried out Campfire, I've tried out Scrivener, I've tried out MediaWiki. There was a time in my life where, my husband's a programmer, and there was a time in my life where I had self-hosted a MediaWiki installation and I had, you have to like install a different package of Lua that isn't documented because it's yep. open source, which is not a criticism of the open source community, but to really get everything out of a MediaWiki installation, you basically have to be an actual programmer as your yeah. full-time job. And in fact, I once paid an actual full-time programmer <laughs> who to try to get um, genealogy info boxes to work on my installation. And after right. like, after like six hours, he was like, look, ma'am, unless you have, you know, enough money to be an enterprise competitor, you can't do this <laughs> as a regular person. And I was like, yep. oh, well, thanks. <laughs> I guess mm -hmm. I need something else. So I was, I was talking to a friend of mine and she also really enjoys sort of cutting edge writing technology. And she was like, Oh, you've got to check this out. All the people in the forums for this new, this new software obsidian, they've, they've really got all these different amazing workflows and it's so flexible and you should, you know, you should check it out. You like this kind of thing. And I checked it out and I was like, I don't know, that seems really complicated. And then I went back to it and I was like, it doesn't seem that bad. And then I went back to it and I was like, no, I can do this. I can do this. I know, I know a little bit of CSS. I'll be fine. And the people, once I figured out the Discord existed, I was like, oh, this is amazing. Yep. And now I'm like 300 notes in and, you know, a moderator helping answer other people's yep. questions. <laughs> it's a, it's That's a awesome. wonderful software. But yeah, a friend told me about it. And she, um, she's a, a published writer who does it for a living. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was like, sure, I'll check it out. And the rest is history that you're about to learn. Cool. All right. So can you share with us? Your I obsidian so. and your setup and how you go so. about fiction writing and and maybe what you're working on now. 
Sure thing. Okay. So in theory that worked. Yes. And we so screen. we now have my uh, sort of landing page as my to-do list. Very nice theme. Is this your, your theme or is this a derivative of? Uh, it's just the generic Obsidian theme that I added some snippets to mm -hmm. from here and there. I don't even know if you could call it a theme. Mm -hmm. It's just, I don't know. The devs like purple, so I went with it. Well, the purple and some of the font is definitely yours. <laughs> the font is different. Um, the font is a practical thing. Uh, I imagine most people don't bother with uh, commenting, but in the old font, if you did an arrow, it would autocomplete which right. doesn't matter until you're trying to do uh, no comments right. and only one of them audio completes mm -hmm. and then you get mad. So I changed yep. it. I like the old font, but yeah, it's, it's just a different font um, for yeah. practical considerations. Got it. And I see you're using the calendar plugin. I'm just kind of like I, every time I see somebody's, you know, obsidian layout and we all have our own layouts, right? But every time I see somebody else's layout, I always think, Ooh, what are they doing that, that, is clever or interesting that that I could take a look at. Well, sure. Let's take a look at my usage of calendars. This is mm -hmm. a random day. So I use the daily note for all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. In this particular note, I read something cool on Reddit that reminded me of something that I could actually use. And I, I some people call it a resonance calendar. I'm not sure I'm doing it like the correct way to use a resonance calendar. But I read something that resonated with me and I wrote a little note on it. I marked where I got it from. I gave a link and then I was careful to say, you could use this for this thing. So it's, yep. I mean, I use the calendar plugin for my actual, I guess, raw note taking. Mm -hmm. It's very talking to myself about something cool I have. For sure. And let's jump in just real quick before we get into some of your, your fiction and how you organize and structure your fiction writing. Let's just pick on this kind of Reddit thing um, that, that you captured here. When you're taking a note like this and it's sort of, okay, you're reading this Reddit thread, this is interesting and you capture it. Are you thinking then what else could this link to? How could I use this? Or are you thinking, this is interesting, let me capture it. And at some point in the future, I will come back and process this for its applicability elsewhere. How do you go about linking your thoughts? I've got to be honest, it varies depending on the thing I read. Mm -hmm. So let's flip through and see what we've got. This is not a good example. That's not a good example. That's not a good example. Here we go. This is a nice page where I did a bunch of reflections. Mm -hmm. So this was whatever the 19th was. This was a random Tuesday. So I read the rationalist Harry Potter um, story that was recommended by the Obsidian Discord. I stayed up until 3 a.m. Thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I just recorded a note to myself about how they did fiction writing really well that I wanted to retain. And then I read a different article about mining. And you can see that I linked it to um, this is a city in my world building that doesn't yet have a page. Gotcha. But I linked it to... Um, how I could use that later. So I've got this note here about the Narian people, which is a fictional civilization. It was obviously inspired by Sumer, Babylon, Mesopotamia, and those are interlinked. So I've got this note about an article that I read on the 19th that I will be able to refer back to the next time I'm really thinking deep about the Nairian people and I'll be able to go through the backlinks panel and be like, oh yeah, I had that article about mining. I should use that when I'm thinking about Yaskun or mm -hmm. trying to figure out what kind of technology the Narian people have. And then I read a different article on, a, I think the same website um, about a little known West African kingdom. So I've linked to that. And then I've got some of it pulled out into a block quote. So I yep. remember like the key pieces, usually I rewrite stuff, but if, you know, if something is just perfect, I'm not going to put in the effort. Yep. Um, and then I have this tag for follow-up. I know everybody uh, uses tags differently, but I'm one it. of those people who, I only have three tags, I think. They're the green mm -hmm. ones in my graph. Um, I use it to keep all my prose files together so I can easily delete or find them in searches. Mm -hmm. I use them for things I want to follow up on when I have, haha -ha, free time. <laughs> <laughs> and then I have an edit, petting, ed, bleh, edit pending tag somewhere in this pile of things that I like actually need to follow up on for yep. real because they're edits that need to have that need to happen. 
and it lets me differentiate. Um, I have feedback um, sort of edit letters where I keep track of all of the changes that somebody in my critique group told me that I should make, and I mark them either processed or edit pending. Like so, like you, I also am, use tags very sparingly, and and predominantly the ones that I do use, I use for state tracking exactly what um, what you're doing here. But you're right; everyone kind of has their own flow on how they do that. Yeah, tags are great for things like Wikipedia and for my email. But if I have folders, I usually don't want tags. And I know that that is a controversial statement. <laughs> some people have some feelings about folders. Mm -hmm. But um, for me, and I don't know, I imagine you can see my screen. My my folders are so very easy to separate out into different things. Like there's there's no question for me of oh, I don't know which folder this is going to go into. Right. The the Johnny Decimal thing worked yep. wonderfully for me. I have. Mm -hmm. There is never going to be a case where I don't know if Mesopotamia is going to go into world building or real life <laughs> concepts civilizations. I yep. know exactly where Mesopotamia gets filed. This is cool. Yeah, this is it makes perfect sense. So um, let me let me make one point and then I have a question for you. And the point I wanted to make is something you hit on before that there is there's no right way to organize a system. And I think one of the challenges that so many of us fall into is trying to perfect our system and, and trying to make it better. And not that there's anything wrong with enhancing our system. The challenge is when that becomes um, a blockage to getting actual work done. And I myself had found myself in the past in many occasions spending time thinking, this is the most important use of my time, organizing my system. Is it really? Or is really the most effective use of my time to actually be producing content that that can make a difference in some way. So anyway, um, um, I'm a big fan of flexible systems, but I'm an even bigger fan of using the system to, to do what you're born and here to do versus uh, tweaking it. Yeah, I have deadlines. I don't have time to perfect yeah. everything. Some like, I mean, that's what I love about the, the daily, the daily calendar stuff is it's not, pretty. It's not the same every time. It's, right. this is what I was thinking about on this particular day. And I can find it again later because there are backlinks and searches. And that's enough Perfect. for me. I've got the thought when it comes up again, I'll be able to find it again. Okay. So then the question before we get into your structure and, and if you could walk us through your folders and what you're doing there, but before that, so you made an interesting point a couple of minutes ago about the idea of like what tools um, certain characters use or, you know, characteristics of a specific character or world. And I'm wondering, and I have never thought about this before because I'm not a fiction writer. How do fiction writers typically track this sort of, you know, history and genealogy of their, <laughs> of their world elements in a way that they're, they keep them consistent throughout the story or throughout multiple novels. And I just have never thought about this before. And when you brought that up, I thought, wow, I could see how Obsidian, and I can't wait to see how you do it, but how, what's traditional fiction writing, how do they do it? It varies, which will surprise no one who has ever interacted with humans. Um, I, I can give you sort of both sides, like the, the spectrum. On the one hand, we have Brandon Sanderson, who is, one of the like giants in the field of world building and writing science fiction and fantasy. He has a wonderful um, lecture series at Bingham Young University and he uses a wiki. Um, so he is well known for having extremely complex worlds and wikis are fantastic for that. If again, you are willing to sort of deal with the inherent limitations of a wiki and are very good with wikis and experience with them. Like I find the learning curve to be a little high if you're trying to do anything complicated, but for interlinking, which is what Obsidian does very well, you know, wikis were all you had 10 years ago. So there on the one hand, there's basically what I'm doing just with different kinds of software and everybody is trying to find the perfect software for it. Uh, World Anvil is very popular. It is a very uh, structured 
world building environment. It's it's popular with um, like dungeon masters and authors and all sorts of people who do world building. But I I find that it's a little bit too interested in trying to tell me what I need to have in a society. It's not a mm. note taking app. It's a it's a ground up kind of thing. And Got it. it's a bit like when you're when you're coming up with a character in D and D. Like do you do you really need to know exactly what their eye color is before you get started? No, right. no, you do not. Uh, so I kind of hate being pushed sure for how to do it i just want to like slap some facts down and I, like i'll be able to find it later i it, it's 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 too it's too uh interested for for my tastes in like you said the thing instead of the product yeah. like i don't want to spend all my time on the notes i want to actually create the product so there's a bunch of software that does that legend keeper is actually really wonderful but it's five dollars a month and um it's web-based and i really enjoy local first my own data if you know the developer goes and you know hits the lottery and stops developing things i will always be able to get my stuff out and i really appreciate Obsidian for that. So there are a lot of different tools. Um, none of them work as well for me as Obsidian does, which is why I'm so excited to have found it. Um, but on the other side of things, there are authors who have actually admitted out loud, um, hey guys, it's been so long since I worked on this book series and it was really complicated. And, you know, I just, I'm not going to be able to write book three because I've, I've lost track of what I was doing. And maybe if somebody put together a really complicated wiki for me, I could try to put together book three, but I, I'm sorry, guys, this book is just never going to come out, even though I ended on a really tragic cliffhanger and killed off your favorite character and I have some really big feelings about that book. <laughs> so cool. it does happen where authors get get so lost in the weeds and don't write things down that they would have to go back and take extensive notes on their own works in order to be able to <laughs> continue writing. It happens. It's a thing. Yep. It's a thing I hope to avoid. <laughs> cool. Okay. So then share with us, how do you, you know, what structure have you brought into Obsidian here? And uh, what stories, and, and are your stories, um, do you write for the public? Do you write for yourself um, or both? <laughs> I, I write, I'm going to be very honest here. I write for my critique group. I don't have a strong desire to publish fiction. Um, I admire people that do, but I find marketing to be annoying and stressful. And I find the idea of like a contract with a large publisher where I'm required to, to, I just don't want to. Like, I, yeah. I like writing. It's fun for me. I like having deadlines. My writing group, um, the ubergroup.org on scribofile.com. Uh, we have several published authors published with Big Five, self published and doing it full time. And they're great people. And I think they write wonderful stories. And I know how much of their lives go into that. And I have an infant and a husband, and I teach. I just, I'm not interested in selling it maybe when i'm retired maybe 10 years from now but for right now I, i'm perfectly honest with you i write for my f friends is the wrong word i write seriously i write for an audience of people who are interested in serious commercial fiction and that's that's awesome that you do that because in a sense there's even more i could see even more of your heart in it because you're writing for to, to take what's inside of you, the stories that are inside of you, the passion that's inside of you to, to produce that and share that with your community versus having other commercial, as you say, marketing, you know, objectives behind that, that might, you know, sort of detract a little bit from, from what, what needs to come through. So good for you for doing that. That's really cool. My um, my writing group divides it as some authors are commercial and some authors are artistic. And we've found that it's important to be able to say out loud what your goals are. And I'm, I always say that my artistic goals are to write a book that is comparable to something that Lee Modisett or Jim Butcher would have written. So I want something of that quality without actually trying to, you know, sell it. Money isn't everything. Very cool. All right, so take us into some of your worlds then and, and what you're working on and how you set up Obsidian, your folder structure and, and what you're working on. So for fiction writing, I've got my stories and close the meta tab, you don't need that. But so this is organized Johnny Decimal style at first, 
And then because practicality is more important than, you know, philosophical purity, I go right into a dating system. And it's not and do you even- And do you want to talk, I'm sorry to interrupt. Do you want to talk, Johnny Deswa, for people who may not be aware of what you mean by that? Do you want to just yeah, of, uh, um, elaborate just a tiny bit? Johnny Decimal is a system that I found out about through Obsidian, but if I hadn't, I probably would have also found out about through Hacker News about a month later. Um, and it's just a system of organizing files in a way that uses numbers and folders to make sure that you don't run the risk of having this nested folder and this nested folder and this nested folder and this nested folder and this nested folder. And, nested folder. and then you forgot about that nested folder. So actually you have all of your information in this folder and also this folder down here, which is pretty much what my school intranet looks like. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I, I think it's really useful mostly for big businesses because um, this is a thing that goes back and forth in the community of should you have folders or should you have everything in, you know, sort of a dump just there organized or even organized with um, the Zettel style mm -hmm. numerical system, which I also enjoy and also use. But Johnny Decimal is basically the idea that, and I'm going to butcher this, but you you have all of the stuff that you might ever put into a file system. And then you sit down and you brainstorm no more than 10 buckets of things where if you have something, you will always know which bucket it goes into. And then for each of those buckets, you get to have 10 sub buckets and that's it. That's all you get. You don't have to use all 10, but that's all you get. And Johnny Decimal is, is very clear that like sometimes that's going to break down, but it shouldn't right. break down very often. So you'll see that it, it broke down for me in um, the actual stories. Mm -hmm. So my actual stories, I have one more folder for things that aren't the story. Mm -hmm. And the the Johnny Decimal website, uh, which is fantastic, and everybody should read it if you have an interest in note taking. Um, they they use this for like archives a lot, mm -hmm. so you can have like one more archive or like you know things that aren't this. But the idea is just that you put a number in front of it, one you know one through a hundred, and you will always know where your thing goes. And if you are trying to open it. I know that, let's see, I know that 90 is like my, my last thing that I always do is articles. So if I type in 90, all of my articles show up. And I could also do, you know, I could also search for articles. Yep. But if I had a slightly messier system, if I were looking for, I don't know, Mesopotamia, it's a little bit mm -hmm. more meh. If you have something for Mesopotamia in more than one section for yep. whatever reason. Like if it's, you know, Mesopotamian clothing and I have a character named Mesopotamia, that's a terrible example. But right. the idea is if it's, you will always be able to actually find that stuff. Yeah. Um, and I really like it. But the thing that really makes it work for me, and I didn't realize this until somebody explained it in the Discord, but it's, it's jacking your muscle memory. Like, it's not that I, I'm terrible with numbers. I'm never going to remember for real that like 80 is whatever my 80 is. Mm -hmm. But I know that it's the second, that my stories are the second to last thing because articles come after it and my newsletters are another kind of product. So, but they're like not, you know, they're not a meta thing. And then I probably have notes because that's right after meta. And then logically speaking, I have world building notes and then I probably have my non world building notes and like where it is on the side of the screen. I'm a hand talker, yeah. but <laughs> where good. it is, you start being able to do that. Yep. And apparently it's linked to like spatial reasoning and mind palaces and all of the <laughs> stuff that, that Johnny Decimal is using without, saying he's using or maybe even realizing that he's using but it really works for me to be able to just have my mouse go to the place and open it which is less effective for me than having to scroll through 300 files yep. but some people have different muscle memory and they just like using the hotkeys like control yep. o and then they just type in whatever they're looking for i'm um i think i'm unusual in the community in that i'm a mouse first user I know there are I a am lot as of, well. <laughs> interesting. Yeah. A lot yeah. of people are very like, but you could just use that hockey. And I'm like, right. or I could not have to memorize mm -hmm. a whole nother way of typing. <laughs> just let me use my mouse. All right. So here we are in your world. Well, let's, let's jump back into your worlds and, and your stories. So this is chapter one. 
And they're still working on the best way to have metadata that isn't, I think it's YAML metadata that's for yep. plugins, like like metadata for people. Yep. So I just have a, a header that mm -hmm. I use. And I, I put all of the interlink stuff that doesn't really make sense to have in the actual pros at the top. And it's my notes to self and it's links to my edit letters and whether or not they're processed. Mm -hmm. And then just the, like, not everything needs to be a whole file. I just have little like, Hey, don't remember, don't, don't forget to fix this. Don't forget to fix this. Mm -hmm. But if it's a long, like, no, you need to like go through everybody's feedback and figure out what to do with it. Then it gets its own file. And then sometimes people who read my work are like, why don't you do this? I'm like, mm, because I don't know if it's a good idea yet, but I don't want to forget it. So I have a little section for mm -hmm. that. And the most important thing I think is the summary. And I must have gone back and forth about the best way to have a chapter summary and where to put it and what to do with it like six times. And I've, I've asked in the Discord, like, how do you think I should do this? So I wasn't sure if I should embed it and have it be its own separate file in an atomic note kind of way, or if I should put it here and then put, have it be embedded in my outline, mm -hmm. which is what I'm currently doing. And I've only done it for one of them because yep. like you said, sometimes you have to focus on output. And if I fixed everything that was wrong with my vault, I would never get anything done. <laughs> so I eventually landed on that. And then I have the actual pros. And you can see that this one's interlinked pretty heavily. So I've got the protagonist who has her own page. And then I've got this concept note about what a thaumaturge is. And then I've got this character. And then I've got some research that is, you know, I, the, the main reason that I have this, and this is actually a clothing file. This is clothing. And then I haven't done all of this yet, but the idea is for every time one of my character's clothing is described, I will do the same sort of thing where I've got what the the text is and then it links back to this file so that I will be able to use the backlinks bar to reference every time I've ever described a character's clothing, That's which cool. for a nonfiction writer probably seems like a really weird thing to care about. But the number of times I've forgotten what a character was wearing or yeah. how many different characters can wear gray robes or wait, what did the yep. guard wear in chapter seven? So this just makes it easier to find that information. Makes perfect sense. And then there are cities. There are um, organizations. This is a league. It's like an empire. All right. I'm going to ask such a, a naive <laughs> question. Being sure. a non fiction writer where where do you come up with your names your character names um your city name your world you know city names and so forth so i am one of those people who really really enjoys researching ancient civilizations it's my day job it's also my like hobby so i personally try to have everything have the the flavor of the civilization that i am getting inspiration from got it so this particular story is modeled off of um, Mesopotamia. The, uh, I guess if you were going to put it into historical words, this is the story of if Hammurabi's sister and one of the high priests in ancient Mesopotamia and Babylon had taken over for Hammurabi after Hammurabi was assassinated by some of his enemies. So I obviously need to know a little bit about, you know, Babylon mm -hmm. and Hammurabi. And, and that's one of the things that I teach. I teach a whole unit on Hammurabi's code. So with that, then you have the problem of you don't want your character's name to literally be Hammurabi. Right. Right. Like that's a little bit too much. But if you want it to evoke the sense of Hammurabi. Like you want people, if they're reading it, to to unconsciously associate with your story, you know, Steles and Babylonian gardens instead of Roman, yeah, you know, right. the Roman streets or the Greek forums. And that's a problem that you have when you're writing in ancient times or something like my series is, is very bronze age, which is not a well covered mm -hmm. area. So I get people who are like, but you have sewers. So this is Roman. So why are they using bronze? And it's like, 
because sewers were invented like 4,000 years before Rome was a twinkle in anybody's eye, <laughs> which is an exaggeration. But so you have to be very careful to really set up the right expectations. Otherwise, people are like, but there's multiple stories in the houses. So why can't they just, you know, have the legions take care of it? And it's like, well, because legions aren't a thing, you know, two story houses have been existing in Egypt since the beginning of the Egyptian civilization. Like, do you want to know more about the, the early Egyptian farmers and how they weren't peasants like you think of in medieval times? So like, you're always coming up against the expectations of people who don't spend all of their free time reading scholarly articles about Mesopotamia. <laughs> Very cool. Do you ever see yourself just just branching um, for a second? Do you ever see yourself writing historical fiction? No. Okay. Um, with historical fiction, and I have friends that do. With historical fiction, um, it's how do I put this? It's harder to have a strong moral. And one of the things I enjoy doing thematically is making a point. Yeah. So for example, my, my point with the book that I'm writing right now, and you're going to laugh, is I'm trying to have a passionate screed about the value of infrastructure and the evils of nimbyism. And it's That's just cool. hard to do if you're actually straight faced. Like, this is what Hammurabi would have done because history true. has already like if I'm writing a book about Hammurabi and it's not about justice and a legal code, people are like, but why would you ever do that? Because the whole point of Hammurabi in pop culture is the justice code. But I'm allowed to write Hammur about Hammurabi and the importance Any of the sewers yeah. and yep. the importance of why city walls existed in places that flooded because it turns out it's not actually because of siege warfare the way you would think it's to stop floods and I didn't know that and I love knowing that love it that's very very cool thank you for sharing that thank you for educating me yeah it's I mean the 90 percent of the population has no need to know any of this and I enjoy knowing it and it's a cool party trick so but, but I think reading I, I think consuming this type of fiction, you, the more that you can appreciate um, the context, I think you, you value it even more. Absolutely. I, I really enjoy, um, there's this, there's a genre of, of science fiction that's basically this history thing in space. So some of one of my favorite books is literally the Zulu Wars in space with like reptilian aliens. I, I like that. I like that a lot more than reading about the actual Zulu Wars because you can get you can get away from some of the the awful parts. Like I read fiction to yes. escape and to learn, but I don't actually want to to have the sad ending of right. you know Horatio Nelson being. Like, you know, his life was sad. And if you read The Honor Harrington instead, you learn a lot about the mm -hmm. French Revolution without, like, being bogged down in the boring bits because, oh, there's lasers. Tale of Two Cities. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I just, I really enjoy fantasy fiction. In fact, I wrote my, um, I wrote my, my college graduation paper, it's the, the St. Mary's Project. It's like a mini dissertation. The topic was illuminating ethics via fantasy fiction. That's so really I, cool. That's fascinating. I, yeah, it was, it was fun. Um, so I wrote five short stories and then I wrote a paper about each about how mm -hmm. it made a philosophical ethical point about like how we should live our lives. And one was about tolerance and one was about how, you know, vampires are really interesting. Look at immigration. And this was before True Blood became a thing. Um, so you have, um, I wrote one about the nature of happiness. If you have an empath mm -hmm. who is, you know, feeling the happiness of children, is that utilitarianism or is it not a utilitarianism? Right. And you just can't do that with real life because you can't make the point as cleanly. You can, but you'd get a lot of flack for it. Not as cleanly. Yeah. Uh, okay, cool. So here we are in your story and we're in chapter one. When you, so the summary bit, do you capture that? after the chapter is written or do you begin by fleshing out some sort of rough summary of how you think the chat how the chapter is going to flow and then enhance it once the chapter is written this is called plotting versus pantsing okay 
Um, I personally, uh, I write the summary and then I write the chapter and then I go rewrite the summary and then yep. I rewrite the chapter. Um, some people write the summary, write the chapter, they're done. Those people are amazing. Those people understand story structure with all of their hearts and can write a book in a month. I'm not there yet. Um, some people think that, you know, having a plot in mind before you write is the worst thing for creativity and you should never do that. You should always just, you know, write the story and then see what bubbled up. But I usually have a have a summary to get started, and then I write the chapter. That's me. Cool. All right, one more naive fiction writing question, and then I'll let you get back to your structure. For your characters, do you have an image of what they look like um, um, ahead of time, or do they do they morph through your writing? I actually have a really good example of this. Hold on. So this is let's see. This is okay. So Dacian. Dessian is a general who appears in chapter two, um, and he, this is, this is going to blow your mind. This is the sum total of my page for him. Okay. This is So you do have an image. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't even remember where he came from, but, um, so he's not a general, I lied. Dagrim is the general. Um, so he appeared in chapter two. And I needed to describe him. And I, he was a general who appeared in the scene. And he is a, is a, there's politics involved, but he's interacting with the new sovereign of this, uh, this league. And I literally just, I didn't have a picture in mind. I Googled Lebanese general. And then this guy looked right. And I Got saved it. the picture. And that's what I love about Obsidian is that I literally just copy and paste the picture. And now I have it forever. And they used to actually um, copy, like when you copy and paste it, they used to just make it as an attachment, which I personally right. preferred, and I hope they go back to that. But well, you can is... still get an attachment. I mean, you can drag it in to yeah, have an attachment. Yeah, but it's like a little bit harder. And yeah. Again, I'm just trying to try to write the story, right? Yep. Um, so, so yeah, I just I, I googled Lebanese general just to get a sense of like I look I looked at a couple pictures and like that guy feels right, and then I went mm -hmm. with it. So some of these cool. have pictures. This one does. So that's a picture that felt right for her. And I try to save the name where I can. Um, and I, I just kind of go with it. I don't have one for the queen lady. So it varies. I'm and how do you, okay, so you have this structure, you have the, the characters, you have the elements, the aspects of, of the world and all these sorts of things. How do you tie them together and how do you know where to work? So, um, so how are you, so for instance, you know, all right, today I'm going to what, where do you jump in? How do you know where you need to jump in? Well, I have this really cool task list. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's very deadline based. Mm -hmm. So I have an upcoming deadline in February where I need to have the first six chapters uh, done and polished and ready to go um, to ship my first act to my readers. Uh, so I kind of focus on that. And then when it comes time for me to work on chapter two or chapter three or chapter four, I do. Um, so I'm, I'm very... Like I said, I'm very deadline based. So like when mm -hmm. this chapter is due, that's when I work on it. If I have free time, I work on something different. Um, a lot of my sort of resonance calendar things that get popped into my daily notes are things that I came across scrolling on my phone. Or honestly, I have some that were reading in the bathroom. I have a textbook in every bathroom, which is a very nerdy thing to admit out loud. <laughs> like I have, uh, I have a book about here. I have... Uh, I have the Amazons by Adrian Meyer upstairs in the room where my kid plays. And then I have the Tyrants of Syracuse is sitting on my kitchen table and the golden thread is sitting in my downstairs bathroom. <laughs> so, um, and I have a guy, these are not the most wonderful notes. Look at this page. It's just a title, but that's the beauty. How cool of once, once there's a mobile app for Obsidian, how cool to be able to actually take notes in this right in here while you're reading, you know, somewhere else that you I mean, don't have your laptop. I, so I've used the Git journal app. Um, and I, I honestly, I just use the GitHub app. Mm -hmm. I don't really take notes on my phone. I know a lot of people do. I read my notes on my phone. So I'll, I'll go to the gym um, because my, my kid needs 
the structure of it. So like four days out of five, I actually exercise, but um, sometimes my kid needs to go to the gym and I, like, I, I'm just too sore or I just can't, or I'll have exercised and be tired and like want to stop. But my kid has a very firm, like he is there for an hour because that's the longest amount of time I need when I'm doing yoga. And for the day where I'm doing a 30 minute different thing, that means I get 30 minutes to work on something at the gym. Yep. Uh, they, I go to the YMCA and they have a really nice little area um, with tables. So I, I open up GitHub on my phone and then I have my notes there and I write on paper. And I could take a laptop and sometimes I do, but I really like writing on paper. I'm, yeah. I'm, there is something about just the, the brain pan tactile sort of flow. Yeah. But like, so okay. even though, even though this is, um, this is just the title right now and I will go through and add stuff. The backlinks are from these daily notes that I was talking about. Yeah. So I've got, I made notes on Christmas. I made notes after that. And then, so these are all my sort of, top level thoughts of yep. just like, as I was reading, here's a thought I had that day and they're all findable. So I don't feel a need to embed them right now. For sure. Because what do you I really it. get out of yep. embedding it? Like, what do I get? Um, and that's been the hardest thing with Obsidian for me is that realization of, wait, I could save myself work and not do that yep. because Obsidian does it for me. Yeah. And I'm sure that one day I will go through and embed things when I'm really worried about taking notes in my, like I'll, when I transfer over my handwritten annotations, because I'm a very analog person and handwrite my annotations. Mm -hmm. um, so when I go through and actually process all of the things that I've learned from this book, which I've done here, um, I will be able to refer back to that. Yep. Because you could also I, use, and I presume you probably do a no craft for that type of thing as well. To I see could. it visually. I find that the graph that comes stock is pretty solid for most of the stuff that I'm doing. Yeah. Um, just because like, I'm not an academic, right? Like I don't need this for anything except for my own joy of learning, which is- But you mentioned really atomic notes. So are you capturing atomic notes? And if so, for what purpose? I'm going to say sort of. Okay. I'm not generally an atomic note person. Mm -hmm. um, I, I read very fast. Um, like I'm the kind of person who can read a paperback 300 page novel in like two hours. Wow. That is yeah. very fast. So a lot of what people benefit from with atomic notes is here is the discrete piece of information you are looking for and you know exactly where it is. But the way that I process information is here is all of the information about this topic and it's at my fingertips. I don't have to click through a bunch of things. And, I, and a lot of people use atomic notes to my understanding. It's not like a thing I do a lot, but I think a lot of people do it for kind of their own insights and knowledge. Right. Which... And, and that's, and, and I think that's where it wouldn't be necessarily taking a capturing what they read and saying, this is where it is or something they read. It's more something they read inspired a novel thought in them, something that's their own idea, their own theory, their own premise, their own credo, if you will, and, and capturing that, but capturing it in, in such an atomic form that it could be used elsewhere. Because if it's captured as part of a stream of consciousness, it's difficult to embed that elsewhere. Yeah. And I, I just don't, I just don't do that. Like, yeah. I think it's great that people do. I really do. It's just not how I live in the world. Mm -hmm. I, I spend very little time being like, ah, yes, I have just had an insight about mm -hmm. here. I'll show you my one atomic note. That's not actually an atomic note, but this is from my newsletter. Uh, I have mm -hmm. a weekly newsletter where I share cool things about stuff I've learned. Uh, so why was pottery so important and how did ancient civilizations make pottery is sort of the title, uh, the email mm -hmm. subject line. Um, this is going to sneak peek. This is actually going to go out tomorrow. Um, and I did have a thought. I independently figured out, oh, that's why scholars care about pottery so much. That's why every freaking museum has ceramics and amphora. And, and like, that's why. Like, I was always so puzzled. I'm just about, reading this to, 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 get this, uh, to get the same insight. Yeah, and, and the answer is 
it's not that that ancient civilizations cared so much about art. It's that they put art on the stuff that they made because they had food in it. Like this, the, it, it took me until my 20s before I realized that amphora and pottery jugs and all of those jugs that are sitting everywhere were filled with wine. That's a cool grain. insight. And I'm sure that every archaeologist in the world knows this, right? Like, duh. They know it because they're so embedded in it. But I was in my 20s and I was like, oh, we're just – we're looking at the art that they put on their wine bottles that they ship in their Mack trucks. So it's, it's, it's like, it's like the guy that collects, um, there's a guy who collects the stickers that go on bananas. Okay. And Amphora is the equivalent of collecting the stickers that go on bananas. It's cool. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Right. It's cool. It tells you a lot about the different civilizations. It Mm -hmm. tells you a lot about the businesses and the society and the the era that it comes from. This guy can identify which era a particular sticker comes on Mm -hmm. by the by the painting style that the sticker was printed with. And that's so cool. And that's basically what archaeologists are doing. Mm -hmm. They're taking Mack trucks and looking at the advertisements on the side and going, ah, yes, now I've learned something about that culture because that has, you know, a woman on it who is who is sitting with her legs kicked up. And we can learn yeah. something about how that culture interacted with human sexuality. So that was very, an epiphany cool. I had. Yeah. But I don't, I don't put that into an atomic note. I put that into a newsletter and then I ship it. Mm-hmm. I share that with people. Why would I sit on it? Or I and write again, a blog post. There's no, there's no wrong way to do that. I, I think one of the challenges with the whole Zettelkasten movement, and I think it's really powerful. And I think what Nicholas Luhmann created is amazing, absolutely amazing. But it, it's so easy to think, well, because he did it and and people um, suggest that the reason he did it was because of this Zettelkasten and his 90,000 atomic notes, that that's the way to take smart notes and that's the way to to kind of manage your your, your knowledge. And I think that could be a way. And it clearly was a way that worked very well for, for Nicholas Lumen. And it's clearly a way that works well for many, many people. But is it the way for everybody? Hard to make that that stretch because I think we all connect knowledge in our own way. We all relate to information in our own way. And we all organize in our own way. And, you know, maintaining a Zettelkast or a slip box of atomic notes is a lot of work. Because every time you create a note, you have to connect it with every other note in there that it could be connected to. So um, it's a way, and clearly it's a way that works for many, many people, but I would not argue that it's the way. Yeah, when I have when I have a particular insight that is, I think, of the type that people who use that system make atomic notes with, I write a blog post about it, or I make it a blog post mm-hmm. seed and save it for later. Um, I just, I... I'm a teacher, right? Like if I have a particularly insightful thought, I want to share it with the world and link it with what I guess is best analogized to literature notes. And um, I, I just, how I interact with knowledge, which is different, but I do have these little like things where I keep track of Mm -hmm. different small pieces of information that I have. Like this is stuff I learned about electricity and like, that's the closest I get is where I just, Oh, here's a concept. Here's some stuff I learned about that concept and maybe I'll organize it differently. But I find that my vault is really more for note taking and creation of products than that liminal stage that I think a lot of the, a lot of academics and students have where they're still putting their world together. Right. I think I'm a lot more like product based. I want to ship thoughts and that maybe because I'm a fiction writer and not just fiction writer. Like I write, I write, I'm a staff writer for world building magazine. So like mm-hmm. I, I write on a schedule. I have deadlines. I keep track of my insightful ideas so that I can turn them into articles. And I imagine not being an academic myself, but I imagine that academics are a lot, bigger like their products are huge dissertations are like hundreds of pages long and you have to balance so many things and it's just a lot more 
than what I'm doing, which is very discreet. Here is 500 to 1500 to 300 or 3000 words on a subject. And then I interlink them back and forth. So if I have, um, if I have, I wrote a newsletter about dams or sewers. Mm -hmm. So if here's my cool top level, like, you know, just this much information on dams or sewers and it's interlinked. And then when I write something that about ceramics, just be st sticking with sewers. Right. And that's really cool. When you publish that in a newsletter, do you, how do you handle the links since you're not publishing your obsidian notes, you're actually publishing, you know, a, you know, an actual document. How do you pull those pieces together for publishing a newsletter? They're stripped out. Um, so it would, it would just be. The... You, you do not include the content of the links. No, I mean, I just include like ancient Mesopotamia's used bitumen. Yep. Yep. But the read okay. more links um, are. Yeah, sure. Ex They're actual websites. URLs. Yeah. But no, this is this is for me um, because I don't just they're not just products, right? These are also reference pages for me when yeah. I'm writing something about sewers. This is actually aliased to just sewers. Yeah. So when I'm writing a scene about sewers and I was, let me see if I can find it. I'm sure I can. I'm just I have more things open. Oh, than that's a cool way to do it. Yeah. So when I'm writing about sewers, I actually cross link with. Yep. the sewers thing so I can be like oh yeah here's what I learned about sewers because my my um my newsletters are specifically weekly roundups of the research I did yep. that week in order to write my chapter that's that's a brilliant idea because Thanks. you're kind of you know you're getting in a sense the content is just flowing through automatically why not use it for multi-purpose of, of a newsletter as well as your book that's a great idea and I wouldn't be surprised to find that, you know, 30 years from now, hypothetically, you know, whenever my process is done, more people will be reading my newsletter for the cool history facts that are accessible and, and you know, this is why I came across it, than would ever actually read my book just because it's, you know, it's short, it's interesting, and it's cool. Like, I enjoy the research almost more than I enjoy writing the book. Sure. So, like I, I learn so much. It's yeah. fascinating, but the book helps add boundaries. Like you can't dive into the, the world of human knowledge and just go with it and retain any of it because it's too much, right? It's right. like drinking from a fire hose, yep. but if you can filter it through, okay, I'm writing a story about a civil engineer with magic. Mm -hmm. Well, what you've kind bounded of, it? Yeah, I've bound. Okay, well, like wh when were sewers invented? Right. How did they work? What were they made out of? Well, it turns out that the early ones are made out of ceramics. Yeah. But like, what does that mean? What's the difference between ceramics and pottery? I I didn't know, and now I know. And now when I go to a party and I run into an art teacher, I have something to talk about with her because hey, I learned this really cool thing about Korean ceramics. Very and cool. I enjoy that. We will happy. include a link to your to your newsletter in the cool. uh, in the show notes here. That's very cool. All right, we're we've gone way longer than <laughs> than I promised I would hold you up for, but. Any plug, any other plugins that you're using or anything you want to showcase um, for, for other aspiring fiction writers who are considering using Obsidian or any other unique ways that you're using Obsidian that you want to quickly show us? I think my absolute favorite plugin is the Shuffle plugin. And I think it currently only has like four users, which is a tragedy. Um, but it will create a writing prompt for you. And it's actually what I use for my weeklies. These aren't weekly roundup notes, they're fiction prompts. Okay. So every week I automatically generate a randomized prompt. Tell, like so that. I'm not familiar with the sh shuffle um, plugin. So tell us about it. So the shuffle plugin, um, it basically lets you use variables. Okay. So let me find it, shuffle. Yeah, it doesn't even have a. No, scroll on the. It might be on the left. Yeah, down there, right yeah. there. Yeah, a lot of the times they have a little like summary. Yep. So it um it actually ships with my flash fiction pack, and you take variables and you add words mm -hmm. and letters and a, a like just this one's character concepts. So you okay. get basically three variables to mess with, mm -hmm. and then a template. And this particular template 
will pop out includes each of the following words. So it'll it'll give you three words that you have to include in your story, That's tell cool. you what letter the story has to begin with, and give you a character type that should be included. Mm -hmm. And um, I've also included uh, Mary Robinet Coel, who is uh, a wonderful, wonderful author who also does a really nice podcast on writing and has given lectures at the university level. And in fact, I think she's the current pre president of the Science Fiction Writing Association. So she's like a legitimate, like big deal, you should listen to her kind of person in the writing field. And she gives this really nice um, lecture at BYU that's free on YouTube. And it basically gives you a formula for writing a piece of flash fiction that's 500 to 1,000 words long. It doesn't like It's not a lot of writing. Um, and you can sit there and just it's bounded. I like. I really enjoy structure and bounding. So then I'm like, okay, how can I use all of my world building and cool ideas and things yep. I've come across this week to write a story? And That's I don't cool. always finish it. Um, sometimes I do. So here's what I had on um, the week of the third. Um, so pain foot system begins with a little R and has a knight in shining armor. And then I start writing. And this is actually a really good look at my process. I should have mm -hmm. led with this. Um, so I've got footnotes, right? Like Quicksilver Stallion. Don't forget, um, mm -hmm. you could use this for a newsletter idea. Yeah. Uh, I, I vaguely remember before I had Obsidian that the research I did on Mercury was pretty cool. I should follow up with that and turn that into a newsletter. Um, this is my HTML comment mm -hmm. for a note to self. Reginald is a terrible name. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then I've, I've linked to these different, ah, that's not what I wanted to do. Say control alt, yeah, it's control control alt back. Let you go mm -hmm. back. Um, mm, there we go. Open a new pane. It's not created because I just did that. Right. They don't exist yet. This one does. Um, so I have these HTML comments, mm -hmm. and I'm like, oh hey, like you, this is a terrible sentence. You should fix this later, but not right now because you're still working. So it lets me turn off my internal editor, right? Like yeah. I don't have to worry about whether or not this makes sense or it's well written. I just like don't forget this, move on. And then I can link to the different pages so I remember that it came up here. Mm -hmm. And which book? It's an interesting way of using footnotes for comments. That's that's clever. Yeah, I really would love better support for that so that I can yeah. export it without the footnotes. Yeah, comments but... are definitely not something that yet is a, you know, kind of a core component, but I could see the the feature, the the, the need for that, particularly in, in this type of writing. Yeah, I, I don't think most people use Obsidian for like products. I think it's still right. very much a note-taking app, but I mm -hmm. like to, um, and it's, it's really almost there. So I've, uh, you know, I've got this section that I didn't feel like getting around to and just the idea of that, like I need to follow up on this was the original inspiration, but I lost the article. So now I have to go find the article, which I think was actually a Twitter thing. Um, but the idea is just that you can use the stuff you found. This was a note to myself that I wrote um, in, a, in a GitHub issue on my own, on like my, my backup uh, that I copied over when I got home. And just the idea is then you can use it. So I really love this plugin because if I wrote that much on Reginald, I could not change his name. It would just seem <laughs> it would seem cruel and unfair. Yeah. He's a good guy. He's uh he's he's being forced to um to choose a new leader for his civilization. He's like, I don't want to do this. This seems like I just want to go home. But uh, but yeah, the, the shuffle plugin is really wonderful. Yeah. It, it's not just for fiction writing. Um, it is also uh, oblique strategies, is I think what it was originally for. But I a little bit hijacked the thread where somebody thought of it. It was like you could also. I, awesome I will check it out thing. for sure. Uh, but Thank yeah, you. a lot of the a lot of the plugins are really wonderful. Um, the daily notes is fantastic, and Better Word Count uh, recently started telling you how many um, how many files you have in the graph, which yeah. was cool. Mm -hmm. But really, that shuffle plugin is one of my favorites. I used to delete this because I don't want to. But a uh, big plug for the the graph, letting you see which things you don't have linked. Oh yeah, the orphans for sure. Yeah, I don't. I don't believe in orphans. That's my. Right. That's my uh, really strong feeling and philosophy mm -hmm. is that I like my graph to be firmly interlinked. That's great, and if you think about it. You know, if you wrote an orphan note, or if there is a note that's an orphan, why? Exactly. There's, yeah. 
like what what should this actually be linked to so i yeah. had um i had this was an orphan when i started and i was like wait why is it an orphan in yeah. fact why is why is it not showing up what did i link it to i definitely this was an or what's going on here whatever it doesn't matter point being um i went and like i i link it to things so that i can find it again so i know mm -hmm. what it is and where it belongs so I guess I have that much of a zettle in me, right? Like I really mm -hmm. believe in interlinking. <laughs> and in fact, I have one little section where I've embraced the zettle philosophy. So you can see the the zero one zero one a, one b one. Ah, you're doing it the that old school way of actual outline type of structure. Yep. It's cool. Yeah, it's really useful when you've got this folder um, because I have Ask Historians and then all of these mm -hmm. things came from that source. Right. And then here's the thing about commodity money. And then here's another reference that's really on the same topic. Mm -hmm. I would love to do it for my academic, um, like my real life concepts. But I, yeah, I don't know how much you know about ancient civilizations, but do the Hittites belong with the Egyptians or the Mesopotamian? Right. Like yeah. do the Mongols, are they really China or are they really, mm -hmm. really <laughs> I don't know. So yeah. that 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 defies organization and logic mm -hmm. so i didn't try cool this has been this has been so great eleanor thank you for for sharing this you want to stop screen sharing uh, yeah okay so this has been great thank you for for sharing all this before we wrap up i want to talk a little bit about so you you became a a, um, a forum moderator within the last couple of weeks um, and you're so active and responding to so many comments. And I really appreciate all that you do for, for the community. Thank you for being so engaged and, and warm and supportive. One of the things that, that has drawn me to Obsidian um, is not just the developers who are superstars and not just the app, which is you know, a great app, but the community itself is, is, is so warm and embracing. And, um, and I appreciate all that, all that you do and, and how active you are in that. I, I'm a big believer, particularly as um, I think you said I'm a power user in the beginning, particularly as a power user and not somebody who's a developer or like, like I'm not a computer scientist. I'm not a programmer. I, I can like sort of, I can hack together a CSS file if it's very, very short is my knowledge level. Um, and I think, I think that's fine, but when you know Ryan is developing plugins that are used by you know hundreds and thousands of people, I have an obligation to, if I'm going to use that, give back in the way that I can. And what I am is a teacher who is good with remembering institutional knowledge. So if we have all of these wonderful plugin developers and theme developers and people who are teaching people how to take notes, then how can I do less than to come in and remember that three days ago somebody gave that answer? And how can I do less than, oh, I'm actually really good at running search Boolean searches. So like, let me, let me look in Discord for you to see if I can remember that. And I just, I think it's important that we all bring to the table what we can bring to the table. We don't all have to be programmers and we don't all have to be, you know, the, the next person who invents whatever alternative personal knowledge system that's coming up. And, but we can bring to the table what we have and everybody in the discord brings something different whether it's their own academic background information about library information science or a really cool link to something that they think people in this group is going to like like i spent many hours reading a harry potter fan fiction and i'm grateful to the person that shared that because yep. it improved my life and it's important when you're building a community to one assume good faith and to give what you can i believe in that that's wonderful we appreciate it i think you're doing a fantastic job eleanor thank you for your time for sharing for your stories um the way you you develop such creative work and it's just i appreciate you sharing i learned a lot i can't wait for to be able to share this with with the community as well and you almost make me want to be a fiction writer i have some ideas so i, I mean like flash fiction Flash fiction is really short and it's a great way to process information. That that shuffle plug in once a week, I'm telling you. Cool. You can get a lot of you can get a lot of knowledge out of that. I, I will try it. And once again, thank you for all that you're doing for Obsidian. We really appreciate it. Thank you.